All right, in our talk about ministry and uh, ordination and uh, elder, deacon, certified lay ministry, um, we touched on what's called extension ministry, which is different from, in many cases, different from pulpit ministry, uh, different from being in a, a church, uh, a local church setting. So we're going to talk to some folks who are in extension ministry, and uh, I believe they said then if you have any questions about it, they'd be glad to, to answer them if they can. So, Greg? Me again. The short answer of what is an extension ministry, from the, from the outside looking in, uh, a lot of extension ministries look an awful lot like deacon ministries in that they are ministries of God, but sometimes beyond the local church, uh, unlike uh, you know, pastors. Um, many extension uh, ministers are um, chaplains. They are uh, working in, within the conference structure. They may be um, uh, teachers or, or college professors. Uh, the, well, the big difference between what a, a deacon ministry and extension ministry ministry is when you were ordained elder, it is to the church. Word, order, sacrament, service. Uh, but uh, there are moments and there are ministries where a, an elder is needed beyond the local church, uh, and uh, that would be something appointed by uh, the bishop. I serve in an appointment uh, uh, that is considered an extension ministry. I want to introduce two friends of mine. Uh, this is Rob Vischer. Uh, he's going to tell you about uh, his extension ministry at Mission Central. Anybody hear of anything called Mission Central before? Give a whoop for that. Very nice. This is a well-whooped crowd. Uh, and then uh, over here, another extension uh, minister would be uh, Warren Bavacqua, who works uh, like I do within the conference structure in the, the young adult ministry. You can give Warren a whoop. Uh, what we're going to do is we're each of the three of us going to take just a moment and share a little bit about what our ministries are and look like and how we got into it. And then we just wanted to open it up to you guys, since you've heard about what is an elder, what is a deacon, what is a certified lay minister, what is extension ministry. At lunch, I got some good questions from some folks to figure out, all right, how do I choose which one? And, and so if you have any questions, we'll be able to take some of that uh, from you. So uh, let, let's get some of the more interesting stories, because I'll tell you about a superintendent, but I'm not going to bore you with that much. So uh, Rob, come on up here. Tell us a little bit about Mission Central. Thank you all for the whoop. Uh, I'm a little more of a stuffed shirt than Warren. My youth groups used to call me starchy. Uh, I have served uh, as a pastor in the United Methodist Church the last 10 years, serving in local parish. Uh, but throughout that time, heavy emphasis on mission with all of the parishes that I served. And uh, in fact, was the Scranton District representative to Mission Central. And this past year when uh, the position open for executive director and the board was kind of reformulating the structure a little bit. They really felt like they needed a pastor uh, in that spot. And so I resigned from the board to apply for that position and here I am. Um, I thoroughly loved being in the local pastorate and thought that's what I was going to do for the rest of my career. But uh, as you'll hopefully learn, maybe you've already learned, as you yield to God's calling on your life, the paths sometimes uh, take strange and different turns that you would never have thought of. So that's kind of how I ended up in Mission Central. Good many hands went up. Uh, it's an amazing place to be. If you've not checked it out, I invite you to do that. Um, we have what we call God moments almost every day. Um, just this week, I can share you two God moments. One was a person who's been supporting Mission Central for several years. In fact, is a person that's in seminary right now. Um, but they felt led to go on a trip to Haiti to help work on some relief there. And she had this epiphany this week as she had been supporting Mission Central for years with health kits and different things and coming there to work. And all of a sudden it dawned on her, she could come to us and ask, hey, do you have some things that I can take to Haiti? And her epiphany was that now she was the donor and now she's a receiver. Uh, as we supplied her with, I think, a pallet of medical uh, stuff to take and a pallet of clothing and probably a couple of pallets of other things that she was going to take to Haiti with her on her trip. Uh, yesterday, I traveled up to the northeast part of the state to deliver a wheelchair to one family and then a wheelchair lift to another family. 
braved the snow and God's traveling mercies were with me as we went. My son went with me. But it was amazing to just see the joy in those folks' face as you give them something simple as a wheelchair or this used lift. You'd have thought I had brought them a million dollars, but it's those types of joys that we get blessed from uh, allowing God to, uh, allowing us to participate in God's work for God's kingdom. So I could go on and on and start preaching, but I'll uh, pass it over to Warren. Thanks. There you go. Um, I, as I mentioned earlier, I am in Extension Ministries on the conference level. Um, I served a local church for 10 years prior to going on Extension Ministries. And my unique ministry is that I'm on Extension Ministries at less than full time. Uh, I'm only three-quarter time, um, which means... I'm only supposed to be working 30 hours a week, but everybody knows that's a joke. Um, uh, so, you know, as an elder, you can do lots of different things. You can um, be in Extension Ministries full-time. You can be in Extension Ministries part-time. You can be a chaplain. You can be a teacher. Uh, Stephen Gallagher, who helps run uh, uh, Salt and Light Youth Ministries, is on Extension Ministries as a, a teacher and as the leader of uh, Salt and Light. So there's lots of different ways uh, that you can be in Extension Ministries. Um, and so, you know, with that, I just, I'd like to offer, you know, up questions. Um, you heard about what it is to be an elder, what it is to be a deacon, um, and what it is to be a lay Lay, a certified lay speaker or a certified lay minister. Um, so I would just lift up. Uh, after hearing some of those things, um, are there questions? If you have questions, we don't want to bore you. Questions? Oh, come on. There you go. The educational requirements to be a certified lay minister. As a certified lay minister, your first step is to enroll in your district's lay speaking program. Uh, you'll go through the basic lay speaking course, uh, and those classes are taught at least once or twice a year in every district. Um, you'll spend a year working uh, as a, uh, in conjunction with your local pastor as a uh, local church lay speaker, and that might mean that you'll take some opportunities to preach when, uh, when those are given to you, or maybe when your pastor's on vacation, uh, or, or whatever. Maybe you'd be teaching uh, some Bible studies, uh, whatever that might be. Then you come back for a second level course, which is the Advanced Lay Speakers course, and uh, you will be certified, knows what it's known as a certified uh, lay speaker. Once you've served as a certified lay speaker, then you can call your superintendent and say, you know, I'm really feeling a call to this whole certified lay minister thing. Can you get me connected to that? Um, there are a series of courses that are required and, again, are offered in, uh, through a program we have in the conference called Leadership University. Anyone ever take a course or a workshop through Leadership University? They are by region. They're not in every district, but every district has access to, to that conference ministry. And there's a series of courses in worship and preaching and uh, a couple of uh, conflict management and resolution, uh, spirituality. And by working your way through those, uh, those courses uh, and working with a supervising clergy person uh, who also coaches and guides along the way. Uh, it does not, unlike ordination, require a college degree. It does not require seminary or anything because it's a different kind of ministry. Other questions that you have? Uh, I know there's more. Let me ask a question to you to kind of... Uh, help you out. Uh, we had a conversation at our table at lunch, and somebody said, well, how do I know if, if pulpit ministry, if being the local church pastor is not what I'm feeling called to do, how do I know what I should be, whether I should be a deacon or whether I should be an elder on extension ministry or, or, or whether I should just go do this, this, this occupation without the blessing of the church uh, anyway? How do you know? There are certain ministries that will require you to have uh, ordination. 
I know uh, uh, Chris Schaefer is a pastor in the Wellsboro District whose uh, who's ultimate calling is to be a chaplain in the U.S. Army, and he's on his way to that. The, the U.S. Army requires that he be a fully ordained pastor, an elder in the United Methodist Church before he can be deployed in active duty. So for that particular ministry, he must be ordained. So for Chris to be a chaplain, uh, it was clear he has to go through the candidacy process to ordination. Um, there are some who, who are pastoral counselors who may decide that they want that connection with the church, and so they may decide to go through ordination and then serve that out uh, as a counselor. Or you might say, you know, I, I, I don't, I, I don't, I'm not required to have that to, to be a counselor, so I may not go that route. So there, what, one of the things that we want you to hear again and again is as God gives you a variety of callings of, of where God is going to have you end up in this journey, uh, it, it, may, it may help you to have a thought in mind of where you're going to know which track. We like that there's some variety in our process in the United Methodist Church. There are a couple different ways to get to a couple different destinations. We want it to be helpful to you. And if you're not sure where you're headed, uh, I want to, to commend to you the candidacy process. I have folks that say, well, why should I go into the candidacy process if I don't think I want to be a pastor? The candidacy process is not just a factory to make pastors. It, it's a questioning time. It's a testing time. So if you're not sure after this weekend where you're going, uh, if you enter into the candidacy process uh, with your local church pastor and then another pastor in your district and your superintendent, uh, it will be a, a period of months, maybe even years, that you work through a testing to figure out where does God want you to go. I had a gentleman one time that said to me after going through the candidacy process, he said, well, I, I, I've figured out that I'm not being called to be a pastor, so I guess I'm sorry I wasted your time. And I said, what do you mean? He said, well, isn't candidacy about turning out pastors? I said, no, candidacy is about hearing the voice of God, asking the questions, and lingering long enough to know the answers. I said, if you got an answer, then this process of candidacy was a rousing success. So I commend that, uh, I commend that to you. Um, as I mentioned before, I didn't know that I would end up where I'm at now, so that you can look at it from that other perspective. You may not know where God's going to lead you, but God will use those gifts and abilities through the steps. I was a school teacher in the, in the business department of a secondary high school before going into ministry, and my gifts that I found through that time in candidacy and working through the church is administrative and also empowering those to carry out what it is God's leading you to do. And here it is, a perfect fit now because my passion is for mission, and here I am in an administrative position, working with my passion and following God's lead. So it's an amazing way to just kind of trust some of those steps as you go. You may not know the answer. I had somebody tell me when I started this process many, many years ago to not necessarily focus so much on the end as to enjoy that journey. It's a, you know, you've heard that story in many other ways. But enjoy that process and really trust in God's leading as you go each day and stay open yeah. I, I when I first heard my call I thought I wanted to be a campus pastor um, and <laughs> easy um, you know so uh, it didn't take me that direction um, I became a local church pastor um, but I chose going the elders route because the elders route opened more doors for me. And as young as I was, I knew that I wanted as many doors open to me later in life if I chose to become a you know, campus pastor or a director of uh, camping ministry or do what I'm doing now. I wanted those doors open. Um, and so that's why I chose it. I wonder if you could uh, Greg, talk a little bit about uh, the, the candidacy process, how they initiate that. Anybody that's been uh, looking at the candidacy process, you know there are some steps. The good news is, I'm going to give you the short version. Say, all God's people said, amen. Amen. The short version is, if you're feeling called and you want to initiate the candidacy process, you, I assume at this point, are all part of uh, some worshiping community within the United Methodist Church. Yes? 
All right, and there is somebody in the front of that room uh, who is your spiritual leader, your pastor. Uh, go to that person and say, I'm feeling this thing. They probably already know that because you're here this weekend. But the first conversation that you have in the first part of that process, uh, you'll go through some things with your local church pastor. And as you guys do a little testing together, if you decide, you know what, I want to dig a little deeper, uh, then with your pastor, you would call your district superintendent. That's what I am. That's my extension ministry, which is a support in my district to all of the churches and, uh, and pastors within my district. Uh, it is then the district superintendent's job to pair you up with another pastor who lives nearby you uh, who can walk you through this candidacy process. You get a... Yeah, you get a, a guidebook and, and you meet together over coffee or uh, talk through that, that process. But the short version is, if you want to get started, your pastor knows how to get that started because they've been through it themselves. So talk to your local church pastor, and uh, as that progresses, they'll connect you to your superintendent. And let me be clear, if you, I, I have a youth on the Young People's Ministry Council that is running into difficulty with her pastor, supporting her call into ministry. If you run into that situation, you can always contact me or Greg, and we will be happy to help you get, you know, into that way. Um, and certainly, I'll, you know, let the district superintendent in your district know, you know, this person really is trying to to get there and is running into some roadblocks with their pastor, can you kind of help with that? Um, and, you know, it, you shouldn't have to run into that. And it's very few and far between, but there, there are a few uh, that, you know, say, oh, well, you're a woman. You, you can't go into ministry, um, which is horrible. Um, so don't let that stop you. Uh, there are other people who, within the denomination who can help you get over some of those hurdles.